morning. You're very welcome along to Ireland AM on Virgin Media One. It's great to have you with us. It is. It's Tuesday, the 5th of March, and we have got lots coming up on the show. Uh, yes, coming up very shortly. It is a big day over at RTE as they look set to appoint the new chair of the board this morning. We're going to have more on that story, of which there's lots, and also the other headlines very, very shortly. Indeed. Plus, the bank of mum and dad. We're finding out why parents are giving their lifetime loans to adult children. They're doing this also so that they can purchase a house. And we're wondering, did you have to get help from your parents in order to get that mortgage? 0896 111 We'd love to hear from you. Or the pressure as a parent to gift. To give it. And uh, obviously get your son or daughter on the property ladder. Also, he shared the screen with Hollywood A-listers like Austin Butler, Barry Keoghan. We're going to chat to the Belfast actor Anthony Boyle about his role in Masters of the Air Show. It took 10 years to make. Indeed, all that plus ahead of World Book Day this week, we're asking the questions, are fairy tales too scary for kids? And should we be changing them to make it a nicer world? Grandma's fine, there's no wolf. Yeah. Everything's happy. Is that what we should be doing? 0896 111 We'd love to hear yeah, from you. Yeah, do you edit them? Yeah, very mm -hmm. interesting. Look forward to hearing from you on that. Now, guess who's back from his holliers? Yes, he's lovely tan over there. Oh, what else have we got? Good morning, guys. Yes, now from dash cams to GPS systems, we'll have some swanky car gadgets to make your morning commute that little bit easier. And later on, listen to this, we're going to meet a Limerick dad who left behind his nine to five job. Why? To trade Pokemon cards. He's going to be telling us about the huge popularity of that after nine. Now, Derek is out and about this morning. Good morning, Derek. Where in the world are you this Good morning? morning? That looks beautiful. Al, well, what a beautiful, beautiful sunrise we have down here uh, in County Wexford this morning. We're just about missing that heavy rain that is sweeping through parts of Leinster in across central and western areas. And that'll track northwards as the day goes on. But a breather in behind it with sunshine on the cards later on today. So hold on for it. Now, Court Town in County Wexford is where we're at this morning. Coming up for a report this Tuesday, we're off to visit the Seal Sanctuary of Ireland. They rescue and rehabilitate uh, sick, injured and orphaned seals. So we're going to be spending the morning with them a little bit later on this Tuesday and very apt given the fact we've got the gorgeous sounds of the Irish Sea here this morning. Back to you, Studio Al. Oh, Thanks very much. Stunning, isn't it? Now, uh, we also have some very sad news for you this morning. You might have heard that our much-loved uh, friend and chef, Joe Shannon, passed away peacefully on Monday morning, surrounded by his family in his home of Sligo. Yeah, as we all know, Joe brought such joy to Ireland um, for the last 18 years and often spoke openly about his terminal cancer diagnosis. Joe inspired us and so many viewers with his positive outlook. And we're going to continue to remember him later on in the show today. So please, we would love you to join us in sharing those lovely memories that you have of Joe Shannon, got so many of them yesterday, people talking about yeah. his big hearty laugh, oh, yeah. talking about ye two, trying the to fun, each no, other the and fun the fun we had yeah, yeah, yeah. Lovely, um, lovely man. He was so nice and so many messages about how he was as, as a chef, helping people out in the Radisson and Sligo. So you can get in contact with us. It's 0896 111 and we're gonna make sure that the family receive all those messages mm -hmm. as well. You need to be chilled to handle Irish weather. That's why Chill sponsor weather updates in Virgin Media One. Thank you, Ger, and a very good morning. Blessed with the most beautiful sunrise broadcasting live here from Court Town in County Wexford, right across the next couple of hours. Now, coming up later on, we're off to visit the Seal Rescue Ireland Sanctuary. So that's all coming your way live at 8.45. Now, we're getting past 7 o'clock here together. Let's take a look weather-wise at how it's shaping up. I and mean, it certainly is uh, a wet and quite a windy start there, as you heard there with Maraid in the news. That's Dallas Yellow. Wind warning now in operation for Clare, Limerick, Galway and County Mayo. Strong and locally gusty southwesterly winds now there in the driving seat over the coming hours. We had some showers here earlier on to the southeast out there this morning now with some very heavy rain right through parts of Goway to Tip through the Midlands, parts of Dublin, Meath and Kildare as well. So if you're on the morning commute, a little, lit, uh, little bit later on, once again, exercise caution. Now, right across the day, we'll see that system of rain track in that northerly direction. So in behind it, we're going to get a breather, a return to brighter and drier weather 
as the day progresses. Winds, though, still pretty pacey, locally strong and gusty once again through the southwest with top tens of 9 to 12 degrees. Into tonight, it'll be a lot drier to start than into those early morning hours. We will see another system of showers build through the west in across the southwest. So we're expecting another bumpy ride as we push our way into the midweek with overnight lows there, 2 to 5 across eastern northern areas where it will be uh, chillier, 6 to 9 degrees the further south we go. So that's how it's shaping up here. Beautiful sunrise in County Wexford at the moment in the sunny southeast. We'll be back again live at 7.35. You need to be chilled to handle Irish weather. That's why Chill sponsor weather updates in Virgin Media One. Coming up, they're in the headlines again. It's a big day for RTE as they look set to announce the new chair of the RTE board. Uh, we're going to have more of that story and the rest of today's headlines after the break. Now to take a look at this morning's papers, we'll start with the Irish Times. It's headline, former RTE chair says minister forced her dismissal. The government has been dealt a severe blow in its effort to finally get ahead of the RTE crisis after former chair Shun Nirala claimed her enforced dismissal was a calculated move by Minister for Media Catherine Martin to traduce her reputation. Uh, yes, many of the papers covering that story this morning. The examiner leads with XRT uh, board chair rebuts Martin. Uh, Ouch Minister is the headline on today's Daily Mail. The mirror goes with a licence to kill. New RTE chair walking into firestorm as Martin rebuked. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. The government is expected to approve the nomination of former KPMG managing partner Terence O'Rourke as the new chair of the RTE board today. Now a different story in the Herald goes with man accused of fatal hit and run on stolen e-scooter. A man appeared in Dublin District Court yesterday charged over an alleged hit and run accident which fatally injured a grandmother in her 80s. The star lead with nothing compares screw you. A joint statement from Sinead O'Connor's estate and record label stated that the singer would have been disgusted, hurt and insulted at her song being used for Donald Trump's political rallies. And finally, the Sun also covered that story with take a run and Trump. And also the front of a lot of those papers where we're loving John O'Shea's big smile. John O'Shea taking over as Ireland manager. Doesn't he just look so happy? Coach, I think he coach, is. He's not coach, a manager coach, yet. Sorry. But good on you, John. Listen, we're giving away jobs, aren't we? Isn't that what's going on? Joining us to discuss some of these stories this morning is Lorcan Lyon from the Communications Clinic. And we are going to talk about a new job in RTE and the outgoing chairperson, Shu and Nirala, having quite the statement, Lorcan. Yeah, crisis within a crisis within a crisis within a crisis for, for, for RTE at this <laughs> stage. So, yeah, yeah we'll. I don't know which chapter we are on at this point, but uh, yeah, so Shunarada, uh, who obviously re resigned um, after Catherine Martin's primetime interview, has put out a very, very long statement. It's been called ferocious, it's been called a bombshell, and it really is, you know, qu quite a read when you go through it. But effectively, what she has said is that Catherine Martin forced her, her resignation by that interview. On primetime. On primetime, she feels that uh, her reputation has been tarnished and so therefore wants to correct the record. And the way in which she has correct the record has she has called Catherine Martin a hands off minister who delegated to her, her officials and effectively when you go through it has said in many ways that Catherine Martin when she was talking to the Rockdust Committee said there was lots of contact and she is saying there was not I was always talking to the officials and also um, is quite critical of the fact that she was not given board members when she wanted them so she wanted new board members put in place and Catherine Martin was slow to do that so quite a critical statement the government will obviously want to move on from that as quickly as possible. And uh, very much uh, like the board like it was an amazing statement and good honour for I suppose for trying to give her record of events as well but like particularly wanted board members with a financial experience mm -hmm. because obviously they'd lost the CFO they're in deep financial trouble and not having board members there who actually could try and steer them out mm -hmm. with now what's been the response in terms of the government uh, I know Labour are taking a pretty strong position against Catherine Martin in this yeah so Labour are effectively saying that she should resign um, the rest of the, the opposition parties haven't gone that far, but they have said that, look, this has clearly been very badly handled. They don't want to call for heads, but it has been mm. very badly handled. And the government statement on it is, is very, is effectively Catch Martin saying, I was in front of the Oireachtas Committee, I was there for three hours, I, I've said what I'm going to say. Um, let's move on. So that's effectively the government response. Look, there is pressure on Catherine Martin. I don't think politically anything is going to happen. 
no. because nobody in the coalition wants to get rid of the deputy leader of one of the coalition partners. There's not a strength in the coalition to do that. So Labour will call for a resignation, but nothing there is going to happen. And the timing from the government point of view of the new chair, uh, who is going to be appointed soon, is yeah. good timing because it does move the story on. But that statement will always be there now for the record. OK, and just for everybody else, traduce was used. Shun, thank you so much. You gave us a new word yesterday. Speak badly uh, or tell lies about someone so as to damage their reputation. That was a word yesterday I had to look up immediately. As you mentioned there, there's a report due from a professor in UCD on governance within RT, which I expect is also going to be a bit of a bombshell to be like, oh, this is what's going on if you've seen some of the things that are, the tranche of documents that have been released. Now we've got this new board member. Obviously, they were they were sounding out Paul Reid from the HSE, but it looks like it is going to be a man, uh, Terence O'Rourke. What can you tell us about Terence O'Rourke? Former uh, lead partner of KPMG Ireland. So financial background. Financial background. Uh, chair, uh, former chair of, current former chair uh, of, of ESB. Whole host of other board positions. Very, very senior figure. Very, very experienced figure. And would be the hope that he'd be able to come in and that he will be that senior figure with the level of experience that is needed across the various different sectors to move this on. I suppose from the government and RTE's perspective, this is the last new broom they can bring in. You know, like there's no more brooms left. There are no more slates mm. to be wiped clean. There's only so many times you get a new chance with a new face. So we've got the new uh, DG in place now uh, and Kevin Mangers. And now there is a brand new chair that has been around for a long time, very experienced, but wouldn't have a public profile necessarily in no. the same way that a Paul Reid would have had a very public profile. Yeah. People who have ha had views on them, they may not have views necessarily on Terence work. And therefore there is this chance to say, right, one last time, are we going to get on top of this? Let's get all the reports out. Where are we going next? Sounds like a very impressive businessman. Fair play to him for taking on the role because you're going into a storm there. Yeah. And like, it's not like you're heavily paid for this. It's, only no, it's about 30,000, so we need to remember that. It's like, not like Shun went in there on these big money math, wages. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Her. And she'd worked for years with an Irish language with getting... Um, getting really big people to come here and film in yeah. Ireland. She has done a huge amount for the media sector in Ireland. So, I hope to, people will remember to that. To get that scrutiny, exactly, is it worth it at the end of the day? So best of luck to Terence and everyone over in RT. Let's move all over to the States now. So there was obviously, it's uh, what do you call Special Tuesday today. Super Tuesday. Super Tuesday, Tuesday today. <laughs> Close enough. Um, so the special court has ruled that President Trump can run because there was this whole controversy yeah. w uh, whether he's going to be allowed to or not. A couple of states said that they well, weren't the going to put him forward. For, for Colorado, so yeah. the Cor C Colorado Supreme Court had ruled that he wasn't able to because there was an old post yeah, US Civil War uh, law that says if you've been involved in an insurrection, you cannot run for president. It's okay? amazing. Yeah, yeah, so obviously post Civil War, they didn't want people involved mm. in the insurrection being able to run for president. So there's that law there. The Colorado Supreme Court said that this means, because Donald Trump was involved, according to them, in the, in the insurrection on January 6th, that he's not able to run. The Supreme Court now has stepped in. They've ruled on that. It's one of the many cases on Trump. They've ruled and said, no, only Congress can decide that. It's not for an individual state court. Yeah. I think it's better for everybody that that has now happened. 100%. So Colorado are going to re remove them from the ballot. That If they had upheld that, it would have been, you know, not, not necessarily democratic, but also a disaster, really. Yeah. Because they also know, happened. they have said enough of the time, like, listen, we're not here to rule on what it is that he did. We need yeah. to give, if we start taking candidates out of the race, who knows the unforeseen uh, yeah. consequences of this. So right? if Donald Trump isn't going to lose so the presidency yeah. again, it's going to be on the ballot yes. paper rather than in the courts. Yeah, OK. So, okay. Uh, so basically, we were talking about this yesterday with News by Hill. Um, it's the two, Super Tuesday. Lots of states are deciding. We expect it's going to be Biden and Trump. It's going to in be those, Biden yeah. and Trump. The only questions that are left is, is Biden going to be impacted in any way, shape or form um, with, with the youth vote um, because of his stance in Gaza? Yeah. Um, and then for Trump, it's how long can Nikki Haley hold in? And, you know, he's going to win, but yeah. how much is he going to win by? And yeah. what can we read into that for the election? And does he offer her VP? And does a woman take a position as a VP in his cabinet? Anyway, so that's happening there. What about uh, Sinead O'Connor then? So obviously Donald Trump is holding these huge big rallies. Mm. And... Uh, He's now using nothing compares to you. I love that. Nothing compares screw you. And yeah. The paper. So he's using nothing compares to you, which obviously in his mind is is about himself. Which <laughs> you know, like, so that's what he wants people singing when he comes out. And Sinead O'Connor's estate is where the record label has said that she would not want this, that she has, I believe, called him a biblical devil. Um, in, she in did the past. call him a biblical devil, yes. Uh, and so would not be overly happy with him using her version of that song to, to come out there. So they've called on Donald Trump to stop doing that. And obviously when... 
you know, history would show when you ask Donald Trump to stop doing something, he immediately stops and says, geez, I'm so sorry and I shouldn't have done <laughs> well, that. Well, he had to... But they would, yeah, they yeah. would make him stop. They would make him stop because he had to stop using Rihanna's music, Adele's music. I think there's been like 12 artists that he's had to stop using yeah. their music, so that's it. Okay, now let's move on to Ozempic. Ozempic is the wonder drug that we have mm. kind of been talking about so much in relation to Hollywood celebrities using it to get smaller. But Ozempic is very important. It's mm. a very important drug, especially for people with diabetes. Yeah, that's what it was initially designed for, I yeah. believe, the diabetes. And so... Uh, uh, 25,000 people are now receiving it, it in Ireland, but specifically for diabetes. Um, so that it's, it's a diabetic drug for them um, in, in those situations. Now, Don Loche, who, who chairs the obesity um, kind of working group um, in, in Ireland, has said that there's lots of other drugs coming on specifically for obesity and that he's hoping that the more that we can get more of those um, kind of approved specifically for obesity, because obviously it makes sense. Absolutely. From even selfish level on a health service, you know, as well as an individual level. We've had doctors sitting here going, obesity <clears throat> is an issue for our health service. If we can do something to help people, we, we should, should do it. We should be. And, and, and a lot of people it. would see it that, oh, it's just laziness. But the obesity is, is not, very much more than this. And yeah. Don Loche has been really excellent speaking about how this is... A, a, think, a yeah. pandemic coming down the line and massive uh, hindrance and on our health system. Anything we should be able to do to help people but in that situation. It, it is interesting yeah. that doctors have written about medicine management to the HSC to reduce the age of treatment, not from 18 now to the age of 12, wow. mm. which is which seems to be very young, but at the same stage, you're saying try to treat obesity before, before complications start. But I think that's it. I think if you look at the stats, I mean, it's, it's very young, but it's also there are lots of people who, you know, who, who probably need that treatment yeah. at that mm. age and therefore... Should we not be stepping in? And should we be not listening to, to, to the clinicians who have been telling us this for quite some time that this needs to be treated and um, it needs to be medically treated? Yeah. For those who... who 25,500 people are receiving the weight loss drug uh, through HSC schemes. Now yeah. other people are getting it uh, through other ways. Yeah. I'd and love to helping people. the opinion of people at home though as well, particularly parents who have children, you know, to have these medicines being offered to children up to the age of 12. Uh, let us know what you think. 0896 111 uh, Lorcan Nine from The Communication, as always, great to have you with us. Thank you so much, Lorcan. Cheers. Uh, coming up, we're going to find out why so many parents are refinancing to help their children get on the property ladder. Plus, what would happen if Hansel and Gretel had mercy for the wicked witch wouldn't shove her into an oven? We'll discuss fairy tales and making them nicer in just a little while on Ireland AM. Welcome back. Now, the problem of rising housing costs is not going anywhere with a new report showing that there has been a significant rise in the number of parents releasing equity from their own homes. And they're doing this in order to help their children get on the property ladder. Yes. Yeah, so exactly what does that yeah. mean and how does the process work? Well, here to break it all down for us is David Hall, CEO of the Irish Mortgage Holders Organization. Good morning to you, David. And morning. I know we've heard we've been talking about this for a while on the show. And we've been hearing about this with where parents releasing equity for their children. How does it work if you own your own home? So this is designed for <clears throat> historically parents would have released equity for themselves. A lot of older people and people go mad when you say older people, but people of an age are yeah. asset rich and cash poor. Mm -hmm. So historically people would have released money from their own properties. They have no mortgage on the property. House is worth three hundred thousand. They would have released money from and some of the mainstream banks and some financial institutions to use to live. So what now, does that okay. mean? So they, they apply to one of the companies. They say, we would like to take 60, 70,000 out of the value of our homes. Our house is worth 300,000. Yeah. We want you to give us 70,000 yeah. euros now. Yeah. Is this with the bank you already have the mortgage with, some, if you're with AIB or whatever? Some or some historically have provided this service, some now do not provide the service because it is slightly controversial because the interest rate accumulates. So you get your 70,000 euros yeah. from your home, yeah. you're in your bank account, and then when you die or when you sell the property, an amount of money then gets repaid to the lender, which could be could be anything from 80, 90, 100, 110,000, depending the on interest, interest is accumulating. accumulating. On average, it's 6.7%. So give you an example, I did, ran, the numbers, ran the numbers last night, and, and there's a positive to this product. I ran the numbers last night, and I said I want to borrow 60,000 on a house worth 340,000 euros. Yeah. After five years, the amount of money that will be taken from my home when I die is 84,000 euros. Right. After 10 years, it's 117,000. Thousand euros wow, for sixty grand. For sixty grand, and it goes up now. Well, that, that's the negative part. If you are a son or a daughter, and your parents are in a property, they don't have the cash to give you. You don't have it yourself. You're desperate to get on the property ladder, and the smells of ten years ago and fifteen years ago coming yeah. of mm -hmm. this, where there's a desperation to prioritise housing because housing is a crisis. And um, 
it is an option to take some equity and to take some inheritance in advance. It's not a pretty product, um, but it is a practical product. If you're taking equity and you're talking about you know, having to pay back 6.8% because it's, it's a high value, uh, high interest loan. Can you pay it back as you go? You could pay it back up to 10%. It's 1,500 euros to set it up and you could pay it back in tranches of 10% over a period of time. Some of the terms and conditions are slightly different. You can make payments against it. However, if you pay it off very early, there are penalties. Okay, so oh, that's right. the issue, right, there's, isn't it? There's penalties and interest in all of this. Can I ask you one thing? Did you, do you have to be mortgage-free? Mortgage-free and over oh, the age of 60. And you have to have oh, property, okay. property worth 275,000 for Dublin and 175,000 for elsewhere. Okay. Like, it, a lot of these products, a lot of these financial institutions have, as there's a Chinese phrase that roughly translated says, there's an old lose gamble. Yeah. They have nothing to lose oh, here. The yeah, banks, yeah, yeah. the banks have nothing to lose they will on never, this. Yeah. They will never have anything to lose here. Uh, it's just, I think for an awful lot of parents, if you're feeling, the, like, if you feel the pressure that you have to give money to your kids, you know, you've lived your life, you've got to continue living your life uh, and their pressure might be there. We'd love to hear from you. 89 6 one You mentioned their inheritance. Can you give, can you start handing out your inheritance while you're still alive? You can, but it's a cumulative amount. So whatever you give out, uh, ends up being recorded against the totality of what you're allowed to give. And again, on, on this product, like all products, people really need to get proper independent advice and, and also need to involve their, their, their family members because what tends to happen sometimes is Mary is the beneficiary of this as the daughter, but Johnny or Jane may or may not benefit from this payment at the moment of time. And this accumulative amount of money off the final value of the home has an impact on everybody. Mm. So this requires proper independent advice and requires proper consideration and proper consultation amongst all parties in the family to ensure this is safe. So if you're, if you're saying you're, you're going to take a €60,000 loan, can you say, I'm giving you this now because you're getting this now before I die, I'm giving you this 60000 but can you say, but you have to pay the interest on it as well? Or is it back the, is the, the, parent, the parents still have to pay the interest? Can that interest be handed over to the young person or the couple who are getting it? Only true lump sum payments along the line that can be done. But the difficulty, the difficulty, Alan, and this is really where the challenge comes from a taxation perspective, is everyone's sets of circumstances are different. And that's why it's absolutely imperative that people get taxation advice separate to the legal and financial advice in relation to releasing this money. Because what is the inheritance value in 10 years' time? According to the calculator, there's 117,000 now owing. Yes. Is it 60,000 mm. or 117,000? Yeah. And have they already gotten money over the years? from parents that might eat off the totality of the 335,000 that's allowed generally for inheritance. What's, what's the total? Is it 230,000 before inheritance tax kicks in? 335 now. 335. Uh, but again, and, and, and everyone said the circumstances are different as what have you been given over the years? So it has, it, has a, it has a positive. If you're stuck and you're desperate to get on the housing ladder, there's no certainty renters as we all know at the moment. That's one of the major drivers here. Nobody like Germany has a 30-year lease. They have some semblance of certainty mm -hmm. and therefore they want to get onto the property ladder. This is a way of releasing a, a of money now. Yeah. Many people will say, listen, the money's more valuable to me now. People are living longer. I love you, mum and dad. You might be here for another 20, 30 years and 90. Getting my 60, 100 and 150 grand then when I'm halfway through my mortgage is useful. But to get onto the property ladder to use that bullet now is much, much better. Yeah, but hopefully, yeah. But yeah, you can't be pressured into that. You know, parents have worked hard for this money as well. Listen, I think there's... No, no, you're right. There. You're right. There's a sensitivity around it. And, and, it, it, and there there's is. there's respect around it. And it requires proper advice and consultation yeah. and not uh, any pressure being applied. Is there anyone who does better deals than others? No, they're all generally the same. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 no, there's, 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 they're all looking at each other no, going, yeah. yeah no, no, in, in Ireland, we have a remarkable uh, coincidence of products and <laughs> yeah. pricing. Yeah. And uh, in, in other countries, they call it a cabal. So I think, you know, ultimately, we have a regulator who really has to step up and protect both the borrower and the lender. Mm. In this instance, the lender, by the way, is not just the regulated entity who's, who's releasing the money, but also the parents. These are vulnerable older people in sets of circumstances yeah. that are quite challenging where everyone's under immense pressure 100%. and they want to do right for their kids. Yeah. Uh, but the kids have to have due respect for the parents. And an awful lot of these houses might have to be used for the fair deal scheme in the future oh, as well. Yeah. So that's something that people have to remember for their own um, longevity it's, and for their own future. The whole package, it's not for the faint heart, it's the whole package of circumstances. And you're 100% right, the Fair Deal programme and anything for the parents' value in the future needs to be looked at. Absolutely. But your thing out of this today careful. is get advice. Do Hold not it. enter this without getting proper and advice. And do not allow anybody push you down a route, be it a salesperson in a lending institution or be it a family member or your yeah. son or daughter in the absence of proper professional independent Absolutely. advice. Absolutely. CEO wow. of the Irish Mortgage Holders Association, David Hall, thank you so much for joining us. Very Cheers. interesting. Uh, coming up, should we be making uh, children's fairy tales nicer? We're going to find out why classic stories like Snow White and Cinderella are proving problematic 
for some parents. Changes them every Christmas. I'm telling you. Every well, year. Like we weren't, we got into trouble because the prince kissed the princess. <gasps> telling you. Let's we'll see after this. World Book Day is just around the corner and while fairy tales like Cinderella and Snow White remain timeless classics, the question is, do these stories in their current form have a place in our world today? We'd love to hear from you on He's this. He's ready to go. Oh, eight, nine, six, I can one, feel him. Triple one. I can feel him joining us to discuss if we should censor fairy tales when reading them to our children is News Talk Simon Tierney and Editorial Director of Image Media, Dominica McMullen. Thank you both so much for being here this morning. It's good to go. So, Simon, in your household with your children, what age are your kids? They are three and one, but almost four and two. Almost a very, very important distinction. Three and a half. It's important to them. It is very important to them. You often change fairy tales. Why is that? Yeah, well, I change them if I feel that they are too abruptly violent, too elitist, too misogynistic, which they often are. But what I'm doing is something that's not actually that new. This is part of a constant evolution of fairy tales. You know, if you look at um, Little Red Riding Hood, for example, this is a story that is deeply sanitized in its current version, but it used to be a lot more violent. In fact, it used to be a cannibalistic odyssey, right? So when we are changing a fairy tale like that, we're actually part of a much longer process of editing stories, yeah. which has been happening for Spoiler, centuries. The wolf ate everybody. Like the Grimm brothers, <laughs> it was like, they were really harsh. Those fairy tales are, they're, they're scary. Well, actually the, in the original Little Red Riding Hood, it's an ogre. And the <laughs> ogre dismembers Granny and feeds Granny to Little Red Riding Hood. Now, I know we haven't yeah. reached the watershed, but that's a fact right there. I don't think we're going to worry about the watershed with that one. We'll never know. <laughs> Maybe to make it into a movie. Um, Dominique, what about you? You've two young boys as well, two and four. Two and four, Do nearly you... three and five. <laughs> <laughs> Do you change? Do you feel that you need to change? No, the no, stories? no, I don't. I, I, I you know, I, I really hear your point and I think it's very valid that, you know, the, how we've changed stories over centuries. But also it's a bit of fun. And I don't think kids are really thinking about it that much. Like I remember reading Roald Dahl when I was a kid with my mm. dad. And there's a moment when Red Riding Hood pulls a pistol from her knickers. And I remember <laughs> thinking that was amazing and so funny. And it was such a treat that I was being, you know, given this glimpse into the naughty grown up world. Um, and I didn't go to bed worried about women pulling pistols from their knickers on me. You know, I wasn't traumatized by the story. <laughs> Wish more. it happened more often, to be honest. It's like <laughs> one thing to do. But, but whenever they're young, like, because to be fair to you, Simon, whenever I do read some stories, I, you'll maybe change a little bit. You don't have death or you don't want them to be kind of then asking, yeah. oh, why is she dead or whatever else? But do you think you'll change when they get a little bit older? Because at the minute they're three and one, almost four and two. But do you think as they get a little bit older, you think they'll be more, you know, they'll maybe enjoy the Yeah, I think that's, gore I think that's a really good point. Um, it's about how age appropriate it, it is. And as Dominique says, we don't want to lose that sense of the thrill yeah. of the story. And the darkness in something like Roald Dahl is a really important window into a more adult world. And I'm really looking for, I still have my Roald Dahl books at home from when I was a kid and I have them pride of place there and they're gonna be ready to go when they get to the right age. But as you say, it, it's about just little bits of editing here and there, just when they're still very impressionable. But and yeah, go on. Roald Dahl, I just think he's kind of, that's kind of, you know, kids literature. Or, like I'd read them and now. It's a bit, it's a bit older. Talking. We're it talking older. fairy tales now, and Cinderella. Tales, and... Yeah, they're meant to be these moralistic tales that were meant yeah. to tell children right for wrong, keep them from running into strangers' gardens, picking their vegetables, whatever, right? So why do you feel the need to change those? Because they are originally meant to be teaching us something, like like teaching us, about, teaching children about death, because that's a thing that happens. Mm. Yeah, but they're teaching teaching us about these things in a very medieval, often kind of a feudal context in a, this really non-egalitarian egalitarian society where it's... Royals. Royals and stuff like that. Like I'm 
really not a monarchist at all. And so many of these stories are so deeply rooted in that. I don't know if you've got girls or boys, Dominique, but like they're, they're so misogynistic. They really are. And I do find myself editing out some of those tropes because they're just so distasteful to me. I just don't want to have to deal with it. Yeah. What about you, Dominique? Do you read, because you have two boys. I have two boys. And it's really interesting. Like all the parts of the stories, fairy tales, where it's like death or things like that. Yeah. I, I don't really edit out because I feel like, you know, that is a part of life. And I think it actually can really make nice conversations, like with the four-year-old, maybe sure. not with the two-year-old, yeah. definitely with the four-year-old. Yeah. It allows space for conversations. And I think he does understand that it's not real. You know, he, it, it, yeah. he's not worried that it that it's really happening or going to happen, but it does allow for conversation. In terms of the misogyny and the princes and princesses especially, I do think that princesses feed in a little bit to a larger kind of patriarchal story, you know, and, and the way women are kind of portrayed. And I do, I do cringe a bit when I see little girls, yeah. you know, with long flowing hair and those little dresses. And actually, I would love my boys to be into princesses for the same reason, you know, I, I, like I've really tried actually to get them into princesses and they're not. Yeah. Well, I have to say, because I have a six year old daughter and she loved the princesses. She had every ball gown, Cinderella, Aurora, the whole lot. That was when she was three, four. She's six now. She hates it. That's great. So she won't Praise wear it. Praise the Lord. No, but this is good news <laughs> to me, Tommy. Simon, this Thank is the God, thing. The forecast kids, is good. But they're kids. They grow, they go through phases. Yeah. It's not up to us as parents, I don't think. Like, they find, like, you can guide them, but I think they find their way. So mm. you trying to censor them at the age of two, three, four, is probably do, it may be doing them a disservice because they, they have to find their own way and their own thought on this. Yeah, yeah for sure. But you said that we need to guide them and show them, but I think that I am doing that in a gentle way. I'm not by not letting them see no, no, that but I'm, side. I'm not completely editing out. Look, they get a complete saturation of princess culture when they're watching, you know, Frozen or any of the Disney movies but Frozen's already. Frozen's fine. Frozen's actually good. Is it not? Frozen, Frozen is, is actually... deeply feudal. No, it's but Frozen, but Frozen is a story about sisterly love where a, where a sister saves a sister and the prince gets discarded. But Frozen which is, is actually a But feminist Frozen is message. still a completely patri patriarchal uh, society. But at the end, the whole end of the story is that princes are a bit stiff Pushed morning to the side, TV, yeah. but princes and are gone. Yes, okay, there is a and queen and a princess. But it's still but... based on blood advantage of oh, the royal family. It is. Oh, well, it is, but at the same the time... Royal hey, but the, you know what there's, I mean? there's, listen, the royal yeah, family opening, there's you. royal families all over the world, but I think that's yeah. the fairy tale side. Anyway, listen, it's very interesting. We can see the debate yeah. on it. We're even just, we put it up on our uh, megaphone here as well. Should we be uh, censoring fairy tales for children? Simon, you're not doing well. 7%, 7% seven oh, no. is yes. Dominique, you can go into work on 93%. Let us know. Hold your phone up to the QR code. Uh, have your say on this, because this looks like it could have legs on it as Republicans well. Republicans of the world, where are you? Yeah. What's going on? Come on, guys. This is terrible. Poor Simon. Oh, it's not six, triple one, triple one. Simon Tierney, News Talk journalist, and Dominique mm -hmm. McMullen, editorial director of Image Media. Thank you both so much for joining Thank us you. this morning. Enjoyed Cheers. That. Thank, Thank you, guys. Uh, come this morning the do's and don'ts of intermittent fasting actually we're going to be hearing from dietitian louise reynolds who was in recently talking about vitamins and stuff so if you've got a question for her on intermittent fasting we'd love to hear from you as well uh, we yes triple one, triple and one. then of course we're going to the kitchen and we're going to be showing oh, yeah. you how to make tiktok's top trending sandwich there you go for after your fast of course See you shortly bye <laughs>very welcome back to Ireland AM. It's been a busy hour. We've still lots more to come up. We do. It's the growing trend that celebrities like Jennifer Aniston and Mark Wahlberg, do you know what? They all swear by it, guys. Very shortly, dietitian Louise Reynolds will break down in iter... Intermittent. <laughs> intermittent. 
<laughs> Sorry, we're talking to each other about this. Intermittent fasting and whether or not it's actually good for you. Also, Louise will be answering some of your questions on nutrition. You can send them in to us on 089 611 Emily, you said there'd be no big words. <laughs> uh, plus, Master of the Air star Anthony Boyle will be joining us to talk pilots, period, dramas and potterheads. That's coming up after nine. <laughs> okay, and our gadget guy, Colin Baker, has all the gizmos that you're going to need for your car today. <laughs> Colin, what's coming up? I was hoping to do this outside in the convertible, but it's not going to happen. So, here we are. Uh, what have we got, Colin? What have we got, Colin? Colin? Dash cams, trackers, devices to save you having to hop out of your car and just jumpstart your battery without trying to find a stranger. Um, and uh, lots of other little devices. Lovely. So, okay. Everything for the car nut and the car enthusiast. Unfortunately, the weather just oh, couldn't uh, couldn't do it outside. Sorry, Colin. Now, uh, Al's in the kitchen this morning. What's cooking, Al? You just went, ooh, the, the car charger. Very <laughs> handy, isn't Can it? I have that? And there's Gina going, look at that. Well, we're in the kitchen this morning with Gina Daly, and we want to know what we're going to do with this. This is a guillotine, so the you're going to lie down there. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Head first, <laughs> dump. <laughs> a so, lot of people would want to do that. <laughs> Today we're going to do the viral TikTok chopped sandwich. So it's uh, loads, well, I'm doing a chicken Caesar one, so it's all your vegetables chopped up with a nice knife and crammed do into the sandwich. you have to buy these? No, no, you, don't. no, you, no don't. you don't. No, you can no, use you a regular okay, knife. Okay, looking forward to that. It's coming a little later on. Now, Derek is uh, sealing the deal down at the sealed sanctuary this morning, Derek. <laughs> Yes, Al, welcome down here to the sunny southeast in County Wexford. Court Town's where we're at this morning. We started at the coast, landed here at Seal Rescue. Our Natalie Barry is with us. Natalie, who have we got in the pool behind us? So we have five seals in this pool behind us. We have Kilinure, we have Ina, Sheelan, Iron and Ina. And this is a rehab pool, right? <laughs> yes, this is one of our four rehab pools we have here on site. OK, we'll have lots more from our furry friends here in County Wexford later on this morning. But for now, back to you in studio, Tommy. Good man, Derek, the furry friends. They weren't friendly there, they were going at each other. Hey, being we'll mean. catch up with you a little bit later on. Thanks very much for that, Derek. Now, some of you might have heard the very sad news yesterday that our much-loved chef and our friend Joe Shannon has passed away after his battle with cancer. Joe has been part of the Ireland AM family for the last 18 years. He has seen people here come and go. He's mm -hmm. been friends with everyone, his personality, his hearty laugh and his kindness shone every single time that he was in studio. And every time he met anyone around the country, he had he chatted to them, he yeah, talked to them. Always had time for everybody. He was so good. He was a fabulous, fabulous person. He really, really was a special man. He spoke last time he was with us about his diagnosis with cancer, his treatment and how he has lived a great life. So we ended up then doing six very, very heavy sessions of chemotherapy with the hope that it would kill the cancer that was there. And that finished last February. I met Professor McCaffrey and uh, he basically, Mary was with, was with me as well as my daughter Orla. And he said, look at Joe, you know, the, the, the treatment went well. It reduced the, um, the, the, the cells that was there, but unfortunately, it didn't kill it and we have now come to the realization that we cannot uh, cure your cancer i've come to the realization that i've been very lucky in life i'm 58 years of age i've had a massive massive life i've been on telly with you alan i met Mirren. <laughs> you yeah. know i've had a fantastic life life owes me nothing could i from the bottom of my heart genuinely thank all the viewers of island am for the massive support that i have received from them over the last you know, a uh, year or more. And from, I won't say the team here at Island AM, but the family of Island AM, uh, you've just been so absolutely beautiful to me. And even at my darkest times, all those messages have been just unreal. And I, the funny thing was, throughout life, I, I've done a lot of charity work in my life and, and demonstrations for different people. And you don't really understand the impact it has because when you've never been through it yourself. Rest in peace, Joe Shannon. Yeah, and Absolutely. every time he was in with us, he was, there's just always like, going back to day one, I've been working with him, as we say, for 18 years. And every time he came in, mm -hmm. there was just this big hearty laugh. 
big hug for you. How are you? And even during, he was, wasn't was well all over Christmas and I was getting texts from him going, how's the panto going? Hope it's doing well. Are you getting huge audiences? You and Carl deserve it and all that. And he's going through all he was doing and he was always thinking about other people always thinking about other people. I mean, just on this show and in the world nowadays, all you ever see is bad news mm. and yeah. it just is all consuming. And somebody like Joe with the personality that he, he just was able to come into a room here and he'd light up the yeah. studio. Completely. And I think it was you said it yesterday, we need more Joe Shannons. We yeah. need more Joes in the world. And but, I think you want to show something. Oh yes. Well, le, le, the, my memory of Joe, like I used to, I worked for my dad years ago and I used to take deliveries down to Sligo in through the Radisson and I'd be carrying a box to be shouting and roaring, you'd hear his laugh a mile away. <laughs> yeah. Would you? Yeah, yeah. The first time I ever came on to Ireland, Dame, he was the chef on that day as well. And he's just been such an amazing uh, person. I had a great relationship as well. Like you, Alan, just text messages and everything. But, but it was his laugh. I, his laugh. And I think, I think we've captured that because some mornings, myself and yourself oh. and himself, we literally were absolutely in hysterics with the laughter. And we've captured some of that for you. Just let's take a quick look at it. And before you put it in, <laughs> before you put it in, uh, just give it a little prick with your uh, <laughs> with your fork. <laughs> and into our lovely Beko woman for 16 minutes. <laughs> well, behave yourselves, will you? <laughs> oh, keep going, Joe. <laughs> are you all right there? Are you? So, go on, uh, so we can go put them on, on a wire so tray then. Why do you have them <laughs> after 16 <laughs> minutes? <laughs> <laughs> if you have your cookie, let them cool on a wire tray, all right? When they're fully cold, oh. what we want to do is we want to stuff them, don't we? All right, so... <laughs> so what we're going to use for our stuffing is... I mean, that just went for eight minutes. Eight minutes of pure laughter. And uh, he was just oh, such a character. I did, yeah. He was it's, such a he character. He knew what he was doing that day. He well. oh, pressing your buttons. And the two of you completely and did. utterly gone. Oh, yeah, the yeah, amount of people that were getting in contact huge, who um, yeah. just remembered his laugh, but also uh, I was talking to people yesterday who worked with him as comedy show when they first started out. And they were mm. like, I have been terrified in kitchens. And then I went into Joe Shannon's kitchen. Love and that. he treats everyone with so much yeah, respect. So much respect. Credit to the Radisson, I think they they treated him really well. Going and, through and he loved us, Absolutely. yeah. And Lorna said, devastated to hear of Joe's passing. He was f so full of fun and this devilment. Mm -hmm. That's a he word did. you don't hear very often anymore. Always had me laughing before I went to work. He'll be a huge loss. Yeah, Valerie always had a great hearty laugh when you meet him out and about. Uh, Mary, our oh, sad news. I had the pleasure of meeting him once when we stayed in the Radisson in Sligo. Rest in peace, lovely Joe Shannon. Like, it's amazing. Just even the response on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, just the amount of messages Absolutely. just shows what a popular man he was. And, and listen, our condolences, condolences and thoughts. Of course. To Mary, yeah. to uh, his children, Orla, Emer and Joseph, and to his uh, sister's brothers, everyone who loves him so much. We're only imagining what you're going through. And all those friends today. in Sligo and around the country who, uh, it's a huge loss. Uh, and I just sad. remember him coming in and his children should know this, that he used to come in and talk about yeah. them yeah. going through their leave insert last yeah, year. We used to hear stuff. all the stories, yeah. the good and bad, but what an amazing dad. Beautiful. Um, and thank you so much for your messages. We really do appreciate it. We're going to share them with the family, we will send them to them. So thank you so much. We'll be back with you in Ireland AM in just a few minutes. Very welcome back. Now, over the past few years, many high profile people like Jennifer Aniston, Mark Wahlberg, even the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, loads of people in podcasts I've listened to have sworn by the process of intermittent fasting and its apparent results. Rishi does it so is that he can put in the same sentence as Jennifer Aniston and Mark Wahlberg. That, He's like, he? yeah. Mm. But what exactly is it? How does it work? And is it right for you? You here to tell us everything we need to know about it, intermittent fasting is dietitian Louise Reynolds. Louise, it's lovely to have you here. And we know we've got some questions Thank from you. viewers yeah, as well. Great. What is intermittent fasting? Okay, so there are a couple of ways people can do it. So the, I, I suppose, as its name suggests, you're intermittently taking a break from eating throughout the, the week, or people can do it different ways. You may have heard of the 5-2. So some people eat, you know, relatively normally for five days in the week. And for two days, they really restrict their intake, maybe down to less than 500 calories, which is very low intake for 
two days. Right. What Rishi Shunak um, was yes. doing and has kind of received a lot of attention, he does one 36-hour fast in the week. So on a Sunday evening, I think he stops eating at 5 p.m. and doesn't eat until 5 a.m. on a Tuesday. So that's all day, one whole day that he hasn't, isn't eating yeah. anything. And then the one that's probably most popular is the 16-8. So that's six in, in the 24-hour day. Yeah. For 16 hours, you don't eat anything and you only eat in eight hours. So for the rest of us, it's probably the, if you're not intermittent fasting, it's probably the other way. There are eight hours that we're sleeping in and around eight, mm -hmm. that you're not eating. And then during those 16 hours is when we eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks. Yep. And I suppose because we live in, in a very obesogenic world at the moment, there's food everywhere. We can eat in all of those 16 hours if you want to, you know, so you can be kind of having your mm -hmm. breakfast, then you're kind of snacking then you're having lunch, then you're grazing, then in the evening you sit down after the kids have gone to bed or after you've done a workout in the gym and you're home and that's when you can eat a lot of calories. Yeah. So if you switch it around and you're only eating in those eight hours, really the reason people find that it does help with weight loss and probably the most common reason people would do this is to try and lose some weight um, or to maintain weight. But yeah. the, the reason it works is that you're eating in a smaller window. So if you stop... It's possible to eat as much. Yes, yeah. And exactly. you're kind of cutting out a meal. You're if cutting, you think about yeah. breakfast, lunch, dinner and snacking around that. Yes, yeah. If you're kind of not eating until say 11 or 12 o'clock, you're not having a breakfast. Yeah. So then you're having a lunch and a dinner. And then you might compensate for that breakfast by kind of being hungrier in the evening. But if you stop eating at eight and if you're quite regimented about it, so for example, if you choose those eight hours for 12 noon until 8 p.m. or 11 a.m. until seven, for yeah. example, you know, you're missing a breakfast, then you're eating, and then at seven or eight o'clock in the evening, you're like, that's it. So people tend to go to bed earlier if they're yeah. really hungry. Yeah. Or, you know, you're just not eating in the evening time, which is when a lot of us tend to go into the kitchen, reach for a few biscuits, make a cup of tea. So it, it, you know, like, listen, because we, we've yeah. come across fad diets yes. all the time here, yeah. and a lot of them are really tough. Yeah, and quite, this some one... of them are quite nutritionally will compromise okay. your intake. Yeah. Yeah. So this one actually doesn't. So I suppose in terms of trends or fads, this was one that dietitians would kind of say, do you know what, it works for people. It helps people to stick to maybe making healthier changes. And generally, during the eight hours that you are eating, people will tend to make better choices because they've said, well, I'm trying this intermittent fasting. So you're not really going to spend the eight hours in takeaways, uh, you know, takeaway kind of shops. So they're more or mindful about the food they're that more they're mindful. consuming. Yes, yeah. And I mean, you want to be full, like say if you eat a certain fast food, you're hungry half an hour later. Yes, yeah, so you so tend like, to, you know, and I mean, kind of the usual thing of bringing the fruits, vegetables, whole grain cereals, oh, nuts, the seeds, the, you know, dairy foods, they're the kind of things that are going to fill you up. We all know now, you know, that they're the foods we should be eating. Yeah. Um, and the problems tend to be the snack foods, the ones that are mind, you know, that you're mindlessly eating, that you are kind of, you know, grabbing in the kitchen. If it's better off not to have them there at all. But if you have, you know, a big family, you've lots of kind of foods. Yeah, of course. Biscuits, cakes, do, things like that. Does this go back to kind of even hunter gatherers, you know, the way we came, that we yeah. used to find something, we'd eat it, and then we'd go a long stretch without, without food. So exactly. it's something that we, we, we just We're need to train ourselves. To, yeah, designed to do yeah. this. Mm. And even not going back as far as hunter gatherers, if we think of kind of maybe an elderly grandparent or an aunt and uncle, who have very regimented meal times. They have a breakfast and a lunch and a dinner. Yeah. And they don't eat between that. And they that's kind of the way it was. And even, you know, I know sort of growing up, the kitchen was, you had your dinner at six and the kitchen was and closed. And you were done. You were done. There was none of this kind of, you know, and you might have a bowl of cereal before you go to bed. You know, I kind of remember myself if you were hungry, but there was not grazing all evening. Or We've lost the run of ourselves, Louise. Yeah, I know that's a, what you're telling us. But things have, kind things, of am, yeah. But yeah. things have flipped. Like I remember yeah. in uh, my grandmother's house, we'd have tea at six o'clock because the big dinner would have been had at lunchtime. At lunchtime. Because that's, it was yeah. a farming yeah, family. That's you it. needed to have exactly. all your energy. And of course, the other thing is as well, then we are doing less, you know, manual work as well. A lot of people are more sedentary. And if they're eating in all of their waking hours, you know, certainly by eating in a shorter space of time, that can help with managing weight. So that's why it works for people and why, you know, but the claims about it, things like that it helps to reduce cholesterol, it helps to reduce risk of type 2 diabetes, they are all because of the weight loss. So they will happen because you lose weight. If you lose weight, your cholesterol comes down. If you have high blood pressure and you're overweight, and if you lose weight, the blood pressure will come down. So it's not because of the intermittent fasting, it's because you've lost weight. Okay, you know, so um, we, we have a few questions yeah. in, as we try and okay. get to them yes, as well. We Trisha said that she heard that fasting can help with menopause. Is that true? Okay, well, I think around menopause, there's, there's no real evidence okay. that it's definitely, you know, something to try, but certainly women around the time of the menopause can find they put on extra weight, their body weight is distributed differently. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And it can be kind of a struggle to, to lose weight at that time because our hormone changes and so on. So it can certainly, somebody could try it. You know, yeah. it wouldn't do you any harm. Again, mm -hmm. um, there's no evidence And would that. you encourage the, the was it 16-8 one or what, what, sorry, what is 16, it? 16-8 would be eight. the one, yes, would you for you. Like you wouldn't encourage the 36 hour so much or? Not so much. And certainly also I should say not recommended for children, teenagers, somebody who's pregnant or breastfeeding. Okay. You know, if somebody who's breastfeeding, for example, you shouldn't be fasting oh, for a whole yeah. day or, you know. Sorry, but, of course. Um, so that, that's important to keep in mind and always check with your doctor beforehand. But the 36 hour, you could by the end of that day, you know, if you were driving, if you're looking, you know, you could end up being lightheaded. You could yeah. end up just not feeling, but, you know, yeah, so. looking after kids. Just, just kind of be mindful. With the fasting, you're allowed to have cups of tea and coffee or is it like kind of black tea, black coffee? Black tea and black coffee and fluids, yes, because fluids is important as well to remain hydrated. So to be honest, there's no strict rule. You can kind of make up the rules yourself because thing. you're kind of doing it for yourself. And if you're really I've, hungry, you I've can done kind it of... And I'm on the lattes. There's you know nothing I mean? about yes. uh, arthritis, <laughs> anything? Yeah, well, actually, this, um, I was, I've just been working on a booklet. The, the Arthritis Ireland have a new booklet on their website. So if you go to Arthritis Ireland, the around diet, there's no one food that helps or cures, but certainly kind of eating a Mediterranean type diet. So again, we're back to fruits, vegetables, but there's lots of misinformation around arthritis and diet. Unfortunately, there isn't one food that's okay. kind of a, a okay. golden, you know, nugget. But go on to the Arthritis Ireland website. They have a new booklet there. They have a new booklet there. And yeah. Neo says, are there benefits to a fasting for inflammation? Well, again, inflammation is often if somebody has gained weight and their oh, the fat cells tend to cause the body more inflammation in the body. So again, if you lose some weight, that may help. But okay. there's no strong evidence. So really, yeah. it's to do with your eating less calories. Yeah. That's the bottom line. But also so. the evidence might come with this because it's yeah. a relatively new thing it that's is. being and they studied are looking now. At, and they're looking at it in terms of gut microbiome as yeah. well. There could be some evidence that it may help in that way. So I do feel the benefit of it is that you're not eating all day, every day, which a lot of people mindlessly, we live in a society now where we're doing that. You go for a walk and you're walking and you've got a big kind of a coffee in your hand yeah. when you're going for a walk. Or you Th go that was never seen when I was You go to the petrol you know, station, it's impossible. Well, you have to go to through get, a maze of snacks. Yes. I mean, and literally, donuts it, and cakes, and it's just when you want to go in and pay for your petrol. And the temptation is there all the time, mm. so it is difficult. Just yeah. to bring that bit yeah. of discipline back into our lifestyle again. Yeah. Um, Louise Reynolds, dietitian, fantastic. Thank you. Great advice Great. this Thank morning you on so that. Thank you so much, Louise. Hello, you are very welcome back. Now, if we manage to get through the fast, your the intermittent, intermittent fasting, fasting, which we were just talking about, and uh, it's what, half eight now, yeah, you maybe could break it. So you might just want to celebrate that with this dish. Here you go. <laughs> it's all yours. We're here already. There you go, that's it. Oh. <laughs> Look at that. Well, my fast is broken. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the rage oh, on yeah. TikTok right now. Gina Daly is here to make us a chopped Caesar salad roll. Look at that. Look at him. He's in his <laughs> element. He's in his element. I dear. Look at love that. a sandwich. Good morning to Good morning. you, Gina. Hi, Gina. Hello. So Hello. Why, why is this a rage on TikTok? Then? It's toasted. Yeah, toasted I think. Toasted hot. Like, I mean, they're around forever. Like, I have recipes for these in, in my books from years ago. So <laughs> it's not a new trend. But when somebody makes it and it goes viral, then everybody starts creating. I think we have a little look at some of what they were doing on TikTok with it. It's sort of... Um, it's yeah, so you can do different different versions. So this is an Italian chopped one. So you do it with your salamis and your cold meats. Um, I'm doing a chicken Caesar one. Okay. And so uh, yeah, you can do, you can do whatever you want on it. So the chicken. Well, Tommy's Caesar happy. <laughs> but I think the the thing is, uh, we saw them throwing it all out, but then they don't have the knife, the guillotine, the that guillotine kind of chops chopping. it all up. Yeah, I mean you can use a regular knife, so don't be put off if you don't have a, a, a one of the guillotine or it's, it's a mezzaluna knife. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a chicken Caesar one, which is what you're eating now. Mm. So you're just going to use, and it's simple as throwing your lettuce down on the table. So what I have in mind is I have seasoned chicken, so I've seasoned it with garlic, lemon pepper. Uh, a bit of salt and some bacon lardons. All right. So um, they're all cooked. And what I like about this is that you're doing it kind of... Okay, just chicken breast, yeah. Just chicken breast. Lovely. And you're doing it fresh, so you know exactly what you're getting in it. It's Lovely. good, hearty food. So what I'm going to do now is my chicken... Or my, this is my chicken. This is my you lettuce. This. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. I haven't eaten today. Uh, yeah. What's wrong with me? <laughs> fasting as well. So um, what we're going to do is we're just going to use one chicken breast for this one. So it's like a little goes a long way in these as well. And we're going to put the bacon down. Oh, you put them all so on, you put you it chop all, it all at the start. All as one thing. Now, the twist with this one, what I'm going to do is for my 
chicken Caesar, you usually put croutons in it. Oh. So I'm going to actually make the bread the crouton. Okay, oh, so right. what we're going to do is we're going to get some garlic butter, or you can make your own garlic butter. I never make anything. So. Okay, right. So you're just going to put it in on a hot pan. Oh, you're going to toast the bread just in it. A few Italian herbs. Okay. You're going to let that... Now, like, as you said, you've had this in your books for years. Like, I mean, it's just making a sandwich. It but is. But these things... <laughs> No. Listen, I was but asked it, to make this today. Yeah, very, I know, very <laughs> complicated posh I know, but comment. for people who are watching, like it is, it's a sandwich, but it's now, gone viral on TikTok. Yeah, because and I think this is what, what I like about it personally, do. me myself, is I don't like big chunks of lettuce. I don't yeah. like textures in my sandwiches. So what you're getting is a taste of everything in one bite because mm. you're putting it all together. Yeah. So all you're going to do, I have some fresh chia batter rolls here. You're just going to pop it down into that. And toast them in and the, toast the them off, and you're going to get that nice flavour. So this is the fun part. So we're going to put right, down come some on, let's have a look. parmesan. Time to get chopping. <laughs> and you see this in a couple of the uh, there's like now you'd have mussels. I'm <laughs> you'd, yeah. you'd have mussels doing this because I was doing this yesterday, and I was sweating, absolutely sweating. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now the thing about this is that you can do the texture. You can have it as fine or as chunky or whatever way you like. I like mine really, really fine. So that's uh -huh. with the guillotine. Or if you just have a knife at home, you're literally just okay. chopping it up. And it's, it's so simple. It's so easy. <laughs> <laughs> right. And would you put it all into a bowl then with kind of some sauce? Yeah, so to I'm going to do a chunky one here because mm -hmm. I don't have much time. But normally I would cut that down really, really fine. Are you really giving fine. the guillotine a miss? Yeah. What do you need to give up? Mm. So these are really handy. These are like Your baker's pizza tools. scooper thing. Yeah, um, Where are they? They're like... It's for bread. For scoop, a scoopy upper. <laughs> I don't know what it's called. Pop it into a bowl. And then all you're going to do the is get... The technical term is scoopy upper. A scoopy upper. Your Caesar dressing. As much or as little as you like. Mm, I like loads. a nice yeah, bit. Yeah, loads. And then you're just going to toss that up. So you're going to get everything is coated. So you're not... Like, I got a... I did a, a lovely breakfast one last week. I bought a breakfast roll in Ooh. a shop for seven quid. There was a bit of pudding here, a bit of a sausage here, and a bit of rasher in the middle. So it was like that trying it's to eat so it. It's so annoying, isn't it? So Jerry? this way like... you're getting everything all in one bite. It's really, really tasty. And it's just, you it's nice. You can't be teasing us saying you're getting, you could make a breakfast one for us. <laughs> well, I, I was going to make the breakfast one, but... Uh... Oh, no, I like the Caesar. It's very tasty. And then this all you're going to do is pop it out on, a, on your chia batter there. Again, just rough and ready, like myself. Doesn't have to be anything fancy. Normally now I'd have a a bit of baking paper underneath it, like I did with your guys. Yeah. Uh, wrap it up, a bit more Caesar dressing. Like, and send uh, send the kids off to school with their sandwich or whatever else you need, or even enjoy it yourself, it's great. Bit of Parmesan. And that's it, it's so, so simple. Now that I one see is... the way you wrap <laughs> them up. Chopped. <laughs> see the way you wrap them up? I think that's yeah. a lovely little idea as well, just to give to people as they're coming in. Yeah. You know, if they were putting them around the table. Yeah, and like a sandwich like that, you could you could cut that up into four or five pieces. You're not going well to be giving have... these out of the, the dinner party, Al. <laughs> no, but... <laughs> but um, um, yeah, so that's Dana, it. it's absolutely it's delicious. Yummy. It really is. It's yummy. Thank you very Thank much. Are you going to have that one? Gina Daly, as Thank always, so the much. Daily Dish. Thanks, Thank guys. you for that. Now, coming up from cameras to chargers, gadgets guru uh, Colin Baker is here with all the best buys for your for your banger. For your nice yeah, car. After the break. You have a nice car like Tommy. Now, thanks for staying with us. Today, we're adding a touch of fun and function to your next road trip. Our gadget guru, Colin Baker, has some of the best buys for your car. Colin, it's lovely to have you here with us. We're going to start first with something, a dash cam. Most cars yeah, have these days. Yeah, Tommy was just saying that it's weird that with all the technology in cars nowadays, we don't actually have one of those DVR systems of being able to see what's going on in the car, in front of the car, or record stuff for later. Uh, it's yeah. not coming built in in the cars. Mm, some There's, of them are, but not all of them. The Tesla, Tesla have, yeah. the Teslas have it. BMW the vast some majority, yep. some of the BMs as well. But most cars that are coming out today don't actually yep. have built-in dash cams, even though they have the cameras. So, so, so I think it's really important, because if there's an event 
being able to actually go back and see what happened. Yeah, there's an accident. Yeah. Somebody yeah. Going, yeah. 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 Every taxi driver Insurance has them now. Insurance companies are now doing discounts for certain policies oh, if you have right. a dash cam as well. So tell us about um, this. Well, this one is about, I've been through a few of them and this is about my favourite. You see, some of them up till now have been, you know, easy enough to mount, stick it up on the windscreen and you'd put a little SD card in it. And when there's an event, you take the little memory card out, you put it into your laptop and you watch it. Okay. But this is slightly different in that it has Wi-Fi built in. Okay. So it connects to, to an app on your smartphone and you can check out the events and the footage directly on your smartphone screen right okay. there and then. Like a Google and camera or whatever. Okay. The guard or the other person, or whatever it is, yep. straight away. But it's also got G-sensors built in. So when you leave the car... So that just sticks up on the... On, right by the right rear by. view mirror on the windscreen. Does it have lots of wires? It plugs in one single nice neat little wire that you can wrap around with a couple of cable ties down into the uh, cigarette So you can lighter. wrap... Yeah, because yeah. you know when the wires stick down Now it has a good battery middle. life as well. It's about 12 hours of battery life. Okay disconnected as well which is important because when you turn the car off mm -hmm. and you leave it in a shopping centre car park or whatever this is still monitoring and if there's a shock it records that shock so if somebody happens to tip the car okay. it's right. recording that footage as well okay. that's 89, 89 euro, euro. Uh, and it's from Xiaomi as well so okay. it's a decent little yoke phone charger hand free system I, again I, I'm obviously a lot of new cars have hands free kits built in and yet yeah. you still see people with the yeah. phone to yeah. the yeah. absolutely now obviously with older cars you don't have that Fair argument, but these things have been around for years, and I still can't understand why not everybody has them. Well, obviously, everybody who doesn't have a built in Bluetooth already. This plugs into the cigarette lighter socket. I shouldn't call it cigarette lighter anymore. Well, that's what it is. Socket. That's what it is. Well, <laughs> but people know it as a cigarette lighter. It has your chargers built in but it has a little screen built on here and it connects to your phone by Bluetooth and sends that audio to your car to the regular old FM car stereo by a little FM transmitter. Oh, so you can, so it's okay. connecting with, with just that little device brilliant. and no other wires. Yeah, brilliant. That's connecting your Bluetooth, your phone, straight into your car stereo, all your speakers. So obviously you can take calls and make calls, but also you can listen to your podcasts. and your, So your, if you have the amazing. old cars with that system not in place, you just yeah. buy this and now you it's can hands-free take yeah. a call. And it like takes... 10 seconds to set up and because how do you accept no, the call do you have to do that on the phone there's a, little, there's a little button on the top oh great you literally okay. just tap that and okay. you accept the call okay. so you don't have to touch the phone once so it's super safe but also super convenient mm. and because there's no setup you can take that to a rental car if you're uh, travelling just take that with a you a report in the Indo yesterday saying we need to bring back buttons because people are getting too distracted too by much their tapping. cars because yeah. there's too much tapping yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. and also yeah. when you're moving around and trying to tap a screen yeah, you'll always hit the wrong thing. Now this, we were all looking yeah, at this going, yeah, this yeah. is a brilliant idea and we should all have this now. For anyone who has or will end up on that dark night where it's rain like today and the flat battery scenario, yeah. this and then you, you're trying to find jump leads and then you're trying to find somebody who has a car that, that you might can jump oblige lead. you. Yeah, thank you. This is super convenient. That's all you need. You're joking. Yeah, that's like, it's, I suppose it's like the portable battery packs and it does serve as a battery pack as well to charge your phone. But it has even more power in it. It'll actually charge and jumpstart your car. So you plug this little device so in. You've got your car, two little crocodile You put that in. And that'll jumpstart a car of up to two and a half litres up to ten no, times. No. The battery lasts about three years. So you just stick that in the glove box and leave it there and forget about it until one day, one night, the inevitable happens. And, and you, you just pull that out, there. pop it on your battery, super easy and start your car. So really, 99 euro and it's a total godsend. 99 euro. Gina's putting, it, Gina's putting it into her cooking bag as she's leaving. <laughs> she's like, yeah, she's, she's staring at it like it's I'm like a fast bender. But um, how many My times? God. How many times have we been stuck and sort of get, getting somebody else to yeah, pull yeah, up yeah, that yeah, car? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're putting your leads into their What's car. That's that 99 euro. 99 quid. Yeah, That's yeah, genius. Yeah. That's, That's so good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, this is another thing that gives you a discount on your insurance as well. Oh. For, for apparently, if you've got a car worth more than 100k, I don't know if anybody does. <laughs> I don't. You're but apparently... Wrong presenter here. <laughs> He's sitting over there. You're meant to be able to track the car. So if it does get robbed, obviously it's a target for being robbed. Who has a but car you can track from... it wherever it goes. What Who cars has a are car over, over 100, 100 grand? Over 100 grand? I think, does anybody have a... I think Geraldine Herbert has brought in maybe two and we've all got our just stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but if you did, well, you don't have to. I mean, you might want to track your car if it's a lot less like but mine. You... But this is, this plugs in. Do you know what? There's a, a little port in every car
car after early 90s called the Diagnostics port. This plugs into that and you pop a SIM card into this. You must have a SIM card in it. I love you the Saab on card. the front. That will plug straight into any car after, two, after, as I say, the early 90s and it'll track it anywhere it goes in the world from a smartphone app. Okay. So if your car was Do, robbed? If your car was robbed, you can see it wherever it is. So again, it may be good for fleet management as well if you've got work fans and the likes being able to see exactly... To be fair, oh. they're shipped out of the country very, very, very quickly. Well, you at least you I mean? can see what country. Yeah, and there was all this... Euro. Yeah. But surely but somebody who was maybe stealing a card would see that and take no, that no, out and throw it. Because the diagnostics port in cars tend to be... And what's the, the last thing that we have? Under the right. Very hard what's to find. What's the last find. thing we have there? This one is... It's very hard to charge your laptop in the car because there's typically not enough power in these little phone chargers. Okay. This is a, a full-scale 100-watt laptop charger. Believe it or not, as tiny as it is, that will charge a big gaming laptop straight off, off the car. And, and then please uh, don't use your laptop in the car. Please. No, please no, don't that's do it. even worse than somewhere else. That's the terrible. phone to the ear. Where can it, people find all of these? Backfromthefuture.ie. Backfromthefuture.ie. We didn't even we get, didn't to, get to, to my big, app, big machine. I this know. Is the, can, do I have a second? No. No, no I don't. I no. Don't. His, Classic. No time his, for your big machine. His big machine will have to wait for another day. That's a Joe Shannon special for the day that's in. I think that was it. Uh, thank you so much. Thank Back from you. the future. .ie. That looks amazing. Now, coming up, he's worked with the likes of Steven Spielberg, Tom Hanks, and Austin Butler. We check in with the rising star, Anthony Boyle. And got to catch them all. We meet the Pokemon card collector who turned a simple hobby into a full time job. We'll see you in a few minutes. Welcome back, lots more still to come here on Ireland M. Um. Fresh off the set of his new wartime drama, Masters of Air, Anthony, Anthony, actor Anthony Boyle will join us to chat. Famous friends and working with Hollywood greats. Uh, he's well on his way to catching them all. A uh, passionate Pokemon collector, Tony Gamble, joins us in studio. He's over there with Alan. Uh, how are you getting on, Al? Yes, thank you very much. That's right, nearly 30 years, can you imagine, since Pokemon first graced our screens, and it's still as popular for as ever. And very shortly, we're going to be finding out why some cards can fetch, well, hundreds or thousands, Tony, hundreds? Uh, I think hundreds of thousands. Hundreds <laughs> of thousands. <laughs> and you have some rare ones with you this morning. Yeah. How long have you been collecting them now? About 25 years since I was in college, so yeah, it's been a long time, but... Um, and how many do yeah. you have? I've got so many, it's like, Kitchen's full, table's full, everything. <laughs> everywhere. Crazy. The house is just it's full covered. of it. Uh, catching up with that a little later on. Now, Derek's been making some fishy friends this morning. How are you getting on, Derek? Well, fishy friends and furry friends. I'll welcome down here to Seal Rescue Ireland. We're down here in County Wicklow, right across the morning. Lauren, what have we got here? <laughs> so we have a bucket of herring to feed our seals. So this is what we predominantly feed them. So it's quite a fatty fish to help them put on some weight. Um, so that's what we're going to feed. And where do you get it from? We get it from a small sustainable place up in Donegal. All right. Uh, it's, it smells pretty fishy here this morning. It's very strong, isn't it? OK, you go feed them there. Back to your studio. Woo, very fishy. This week on Ireland AM, we've teamed up with Tipperary Crystal to give away an amazing prize to one lucky viewer. To celebrate Mother's Day, Tipperary Crystal are giving one lucky viewer the chance to win €2,000 worth of products from their entire collection, together with a birdie hamper. The Birdie Collection celebrates the beautiful garden birds of Ireland and have come together in the aspirational Birdie Collection by Tipperary. This is the ideal gift for all the mums, mams and moms this Mother's Day. This collection is available online at www.tipperarycrystal.ie. For your chance to win, just answer this question. What day of the week does Mother's Day usually fall? Is it A, Friday or B, Sunday? To enter, call 1550-999-333 or text WIN to 57199. Best of luck. Uh, the very best of luck yes. with that. Now over to two-time award-winning female presenter of the year. <laughs> what have we been talking about this morning? <laughs> That's you, Merle Sados. <laughs> I was like, Alan, take over. Is he talking about you? We were discussing earlier on uh, the news that over uh, 
25,000 Irish people are currently getting the drug Ozempic on HSE schemes. So Ozempic was originally uh, to treat diabetes, but it's found to be a good weight loss mm -hmm. drug as well. And we've had uh, the professor in talking here before going, listen, if it's helping people with obesity, which is um, which is causing issues in the HSE, Massive. then we should be helping them out. Lots of messages on this as well this yep, morning. Sorry, Tommy, unfortunately, because you took so long there, we've no time to read them oh. out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Annie, Ozempic is great. However, I've worked in a pharmacy for over a year and I don't think it should be prescribed by doctors for obesity until we have a solid supply of it in yeah. this country. Diabetic people come in to get Ozempic and it would be out of stock due to the high demand. This happens daily and it's not mm. fair, yeah. which is a very interesting It's very case. interesting. And John said, I'm a diabetic and the only drug I'm able to take without side effects is Ozempic. But due to demand from people looking to lose weight, I struggle to fill my prescription, leaving me very anxious yeah. every month. Diabetics should be prioritised. Yeah, and it's interesting because more uh, drugs are coming online, like yeah, Wegovy yeah. and whatever, so it's not just going to be uh, Ozempic. But I suppose if you're overweight and like, and you're in a high-risk category where other illnesses are affecting you heart as well. Disease. Heart disease. So where do you draw the line? Well, Orla says, you know? prescribing it to people yeah. for weight loss the, as opposed to diabetics. Well, which they are. Orla says, I've been on Ozempic for just over four months. I've lost a stone and a half so far. I don't believe it's as much of a wonder drug as people are describing it. It only works in conjunction with exercise and a reduction in calorie intake. The drug helps to reduce appetite, so healthy food choices are also needed. I think more education is needed on the importance of exercise and nutrition, especially considering the amount of children in Ireland who are obese. And a hundred percent. Um, yeah. Let's move on to another thing we were talking about. So we had a bit of a debate earlier on about censoring fairy tales. Yes. So do you change the endings to make the, the ending a little bit safe for your kids who are a bit young? Or even talking about the princesses and really are we a, a misogyny? Is it seen as misogyny? Um, Maria said, the world's gone mad if we start changing stories. Did Snow White really traumatise anyone? I, yeah. the, but you know what? I'm, I'm all, I'm all for this. Was. I mean, look at... Fairy tales have been around for 100 years. They've been read to children for hundreds of years. Have it, has it done any harm to children? I remember, like, two years ago... Terrified of wolves. No, but remember, like, we got, we got into trouble, like somebody in the Irish Times wrote a thing that um, the, the princess in a, in, a, in a fairy tale should not be kissed by the prince at the end because she hasn't given her permission. No consent. We do teach consent, consent in school. I know, but it's a fairy tale that's been going on for time and time and yeah. time. And it's but just, they've changed over time. They're yeah, not I know. in their original yeah, I know. form. Kind of they change all the time. Changing it for your kids when they're such a young age. Like, they'll, they'll find their own way. Of course, you can guide them. Angela said, look, fairy tales are moral-based. The world's gone crazy. Should you change Shakespeare or Charles Dickens? There are, uh, there are morals in most fairy tales, and that's what's wrong with society. Yeah, like Our morals are gone. If a child is, asks the story, you say, well, yeah, but it's a fairy tale. It was written years yeah. ago. And, you know, and that's... The, the prince saved the day and the princess came back to life and they live happily ever after. It was, it was, it was really interesting topic of <laughs> conversation. We knew, and even we had a, a megaphone on it as well. I think it was 92% of people said no. I feel no. like a princess 94. every day with my Prince Charmings here on Ireland AM. But you but look right. like a princess. Look at you. Um, Ra Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down, down your hair. hair. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, thank you so much to everyone oh, who there's sent our, in there's messages our poll. today. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but coming up next, actor Anthony Boyle talks uh, putting on his aviator jacket for Steven Spielberg's latest latest television show. Yes, we're going to be catching up with him after the break. Welcome back. Now, our next guest is an Olivier Award winning actor who has worked with some of the biggest names in Hollywood and just told Tommy Bow he didn't know his bum from his elbow. Do I like? <laughs> He's not far wrong. I thought that was an Oliver Award. Here to talk about going from Belfast to the big screen, it is Anthony Boyle. Good morning to you, Anthony. But before we get chatting to you, let's uh, take a look at you in action, your new show, Masters of the Air. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Used to pumps pressure. Pump side. Pressure's good. Fill quantity. Good. We're ready to start. Welcome aboard, Lieutenant. Come as quick as I could, Major. All right, we'll store your gear and get ready for takeoff. We're not going to be the reason this goes off late. Yes, sir. Starting one. Morning! Morning! Douglas! 
Harry Crosby. Ah, oh, like Bing. Yeah. Hey, you sing? They kicked me out of choir. Harry Crosby, good morning. Can you sing? Uh, no, I can't sing. But my dad thought it was an Oliver Award as well, Tommy, so you're grown. <laughs> <laughs> good morning, Anthony Boyle. It's absolutely lovely to have you here. You are starring. You're the narrator of this phenomenal show, Masters of the Air. So how did you get involved in it? All right, I got involved with it. I'd done a TV show on HBO a couple of years ago called The Plot Against America. And the producers of that saw it. I played like a cocky... Jewish uh, soldier, and uh, I was doing a sort of bad James Dean impression. And the, um, the, the producers saw me in that and asked me did I want to be involved in Masters of the Air. And because it was Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks and Gary Getzman, I was obviously sort of overjoyed to, to be a part of it. Yeah, I, I can imagine you were, uh, particularly whenever Tom Hanks was saying that he's watched so much your tape, he said to you, you know, I think, I, I, I feel like I've known you all my life. Yeah, yeah. I said to him, you're not going to believe this, but I feel like I know you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, what is it? Like, to be fair, you've worked some, with some incredible people, but working alongside Tom Hanks, Steven Spielberg on such a massive show, like that must be a bit of a pinch me moment. Yeah, it was class. Like, you know, it was, it was getting to set and sort of, you know, seeing the scale of the operation, you know, seeing that they had built these replica B-17 planes. Um, we had these 360 degree screens surrounding us. So it was just, um, we, you really felt like you were in the, in the cockpit when you, were, when you were flying, you know? It was, it was an incredible, incredible production to be a part of. And when you, were, when you got this call, because obviously this is the follow on from Band of Brothers and the Pacific, and Band of Brothers produced that era of, you know, the Michael Fassbenders, the James McAvoys, Damien uh, Lewis, like you could go on and on and on about the actors that came out of that. Did you all kind of go, in, go into this? Because there's you, there's Austin Butler, there's Barry Keoghan. There's so many people in this as well that you were like, lads, this, we've picked a good one here now. This is going to be, this is going to be good. <laughs> That we all walked in thinking we were the cat's pajamas. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, we didn't. I think we all felt a little bit of pressure because of, you know, the success of the brothers and the Pacific, and you really wanted to honour that work. So I think we we went in going to ourselves and to each other. Oh, we got to bring our A game here, you know. Yeah. Uh, listen, you're an amazing success story, Anthony, because like to get to the level that you're at at the minute, winning these Olivier Awards and everything else. Oh, don't tell me, good man. Uh, but <laughs> like you, you went to school in Belfast, uh, like you had a difficult time in school. You weren't exactly the model student. Mm -hmm. So like what was it? Was, was acting always a career path the way you thought you were going to go and, and school was kind of to the push to the side or how did it all happen? I mean, look, I had, a, I had a nice time at school. They just didn't like me there. They just kept making me leave. But I, you know, I had the crack because I was just messing about all the time. I, I liked, you know, doing impressions of teachers and that sort of thing. So I was always sort of acting. Um, yeah, I always sort of wanted to be an actor. I always thought that that's what I would do. I mean, I didn't have a school bag for about five years and they would constantly <laughs> be trying to teach me things. And, and I would be no, it's all right, I'm going to be an actor. And they'd be like, you know, you need your maths GCSE. And I'd be like, I'm not going to need to learn my multiple times tables when I'm on set. <laughs> so there was a bit, of, a bit of warring happening there. But I think it was probably the right idea, the right choice for them to kick me out of school. Because then it, it, it made me sort of not really have anything to fall back on and sort of just completely focus yeah. on acting, which, which, um, which ended up working out. And it's funny because, you know, we've, we've seen those pieces recently from Barry Keoghan talking about how he's been kicked out of Cine World in Dublin <laughs> yeah. for like not paying to go to the cinema and then he has his big premiere there. Okay. And for you, like it's, we've got people in here who are bet into Masters of the Air. And they're like, I had no idea that he was Irish. Oh my God, he's amazing. Yeah. Because then you jump to school and you were spotted from the Lyric Theatre and then you ended up being offered a place at drama school in Wales. Yeah, so I was doing um, a, a profit share piece in the Lyric Theatre, which I got paid, I think, 25 quid for. And someone saw it, a teacher called Trish Logue from Twinbrook saw it. And she was a voice teacher at this Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama. And she saw me and she said, we'd love for you to come to this drama school. And I said, I can barely write and I don't, I don't want to, you know, sit there and read books. And she said, you don't need to do any of that. Just come and act. And... Um, 
I went and it was just amazing. I went from like, you know, Belfast to like going to this like Royal Conservatoire and you were reading Shakespeare and you were looking out the window and you'd see swans and all and you were going, this is unbelievable, you know, I, I, I don't want to leave this kind of room. Yeah. And, and not having so nice. to do the Times Tables, which is even better again. Not having to do the Times Tables, which I still can't really do, to be honest, so I'm, I'm happy I didn't have to do that. <laughs> There's someone there going, oh, we're going to cast Anthony as a mathematician. Not anymore. <laughs> the big short uh, with <laughs> Christy <big> Bale. <laughs> um, listen, of course, we're in Derry Girls, but you talk there about uh, being staged for Harry Potter as well, like a mega franchise. Like, you've been offered such incredible roles, but it, it's there's a huge amount of hard work and, and you... you you kind of talk about school, but that laser focus, like what was it? Where, where did you take that direction that you felt that this is going to take me on to big things? I don't know. I always just had, I, I just, I always liked being in the art. Like I liked being in the rehearsal room. I like people sharing ideas about art. I was always like profoundly affected by like TV and cinema. I remember staying up late to watch like Bronson, Quadrophenia, This Is England, you know, all these things on like film four. And I remember watching them when everyone else was asleep and going, how, how do I be in that? Like, how do I do that? And um, yeah, I just sort of followed my nose, I think. Uh, and you ended up being like, y you were David Donnelly. Aaron had a crush on you in Derry Girls. Like, this is yeah. iconic. People really <laughs> notice all the Derry Girls gang, don't they? Like, look how cool you are. <laughs> yeah, David Donnelly, man. Yeah. I, um, yeah, it's great. It's, I, I love that show so much. I think the girls are absolutely incredible in it. And I think Lisa is like the best writer ever. It was good. I mean, I'm only in it for about two seconds. Like I come in and, and do a bit of smoking and a bit of smizing and then uh, I'm off. But it was such an honor to be a part of it. I, like it just, it's such a success story as well. And of course, coming from Belfast, like going to school on the Falls Road to see where it has taken you as well is incredible. Listen, you have a new show uh, called Manhunt. Uh, the premiere's on March 25th. Tell us, what's it all about? It's about, um, it's about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. I played John Wilkes Booth. Uh, there he is coming up there with his wee moustache. Um, I played John Wilkes Booth, who, um, there he is, who murdered Abraham Lincoln um, and then escaped. And it's about the 12 days it took um, while they tracked him down. And it's about, um, yeah, it's about, it's about Booth and it's about Lincoln. It's about America in 18... 65 and it's a political thriller it's very exciting it's very uh, it's very intense um yeah it's with uh, apple tv as well so they're big fans of you over there are you doing a 50s movie soon look at that haircut look at that curl in the middle of the forest you know i came in the day and the, your, your woman liz who was doing my hair was like do you do we do 50s look and i went oh, why not and then we ha I had a different jacket to wear and then i just stuck on this one and i thought sure look here we are we're doing a 50s look why not if there's anyone out there writing a 50s movie james get me dean in it. James, James Dean. Dean. Yeah, oh, you the take James that. Dean biopic. I, we, I, I was thinking the new remake of Greece or something, but yeah, no, James yeah. Dean, much, much cooler. Greece is the word. And, and also, Greece, any, uh, any yeah. mathematician or physicist roles also send them Anthony Boyle's way. Oppenheimer, watch out, <laughs> too. No way. Uh, listen, Anthony, it's an absolute pleasure to talk to you this morning. Uh, fair play to you, and listen, continued success. Cheers. Thanks very much. Honour to chat to you guys. See you later. So lovely to talk to you. Masters of the Air is on Apple uh, TV right now. Fantastic. And of course, Manhunt out on March 15th. Right, lots more still to come here on Ireland M. We'll be back after the short break. Back. Lots of memories for lots of people this morning. And since its first release, the Game Boy, in 1996, Pokemon has created one of the largest franchises ever, consisting of video games, animated series, and, of course, trading cards. And with lots of my own kids, you see it everywhere nowadays as well. Now, with the Dublin Comic Con just around the corner, we're going to chat now to Tony Gamble, who has turned his love for cartoons into a booming business. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Listen, this is... Unbelievable, but I, what's even more incredible is your story, that you were part of the corporate world for a long time, decided 
stuff that I'm going to follow my passion and that was Pokemon. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I had 20 years in the corporate world and we got let go just before COVID and uh, was locked down. I decided to just start trying to for interviews and I, I was just at the end of an interview process and I said to my wife, I don't think I can do this anymore. I really want to follow and do something that mm. that's passionate to both myself and her, Anna. Wow. Um, and we just set up a Poke Bundles and we're and we, is that including your wife then? I, my wife is literally the beating heart of this company. Wow. I'm, I'm on national television. She's at home <laughs> fulfilling orders for our oh, online stores. So brilliant. Like, she does the hard work. So talk to us about a business. Like, how does it work as a business? Is it about just opening bundles, finding good cards? Is yeah. it like a big just buying, buying and, and selling? selling? Yeah, so like we, we have a kind of unique model in Ireland where we will travel to where the Pokemon fans go. We operate in high-end markets, the Wickham Way in Limerick City, Marina Market in Cork, Outset in Dublin, and we do the high-end conventions. And what we do is we basically bring a Pokemon card shop to the fans wow. and they can browse their their favorites, pick out their the, the ones they've been looking for. Whether you're a kid or whether you're an adult, you can pick exactly what you want. How many have you got? Oh my goodness, uh, probably about 100,000 in the business. 100,000 at the moment. These are cards okay. that you can, you're, you're selling. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and right. like whether it's a two cent card or a twenty euro card. Like we're looking at this bun three boxes. Back in the day, what would they have, these have cost? Probably about ten pounds from your local toy shop. Ten mm. pounds local toy shop. What would they be costing now? Probably two fifty each. Two hundred and fifty, three hundred euro yeah. at least. Yeah, because they're sealed, so like they've never been opened. Right. So and people are generally and do you not want to open them to oh, know God, what's in every it? day we're terrible like we'd be at we'd be at home and we be opening cards and we get to open these a lot the the, the new sets but this the is it because a big thing yeah. is about fakes as well isn't it and because so these are the new ones i see with my kids in yes, all the exactly. shops yeah how can you spot fake because there's a lot on the market if you are buying and selling 100%. between these and we're fakes ve we're very lucky in ireland that a lot, everyone most people will sell real cards but sometimes parents will buy cards they see very cheap online uh -huh. they bring them in they're a good bargain, but they're, yeah. they're fake cards. And what we want to do is make sure that when the kid, whether they're six months into Pokemon or six years, that they have value when they want to buy a guitar, they can sell their Pokemon cards. Okay. And now, like, it actually happened recently where a kid came in and they sold all their cards to us. They bought a beautiful guitar. I so. think I have a friend right. whose son has loads of them, and mm -hmm. I think they bought loads of them abroad yeah. on holiday, and yeah. I don't think they're legit. No, I, yeah, no, you can kind of tell. Don't be rude, really so, kind of so, tell the difference. Well, now you're going to learn something, so right. you can go so and see we'll, them. So we'll give a few examples of some of the fake cards. Now, unless they've come from Santa, they're, they're, a lot of these are fake. So these ones are gold cards. Now, these are actually very highly prized. Did you just pull that out of there? No, I did not, actually, okay. funny enough. Um, these are just ones we brought in. So these come in from, like, China and stuff like that. Oh, kids. that's a fake. Yes, this is actually fake. And like a lot of kids wow. think How would you great. know it's a fake? Now? Just by knowledge, they don't make them like that in plasticky. So like they're very bendable. Um, so these so ones are fake. what would be a real one look like? So that? I'll show you actually, because we're just going to open a very, very quickly a pack of cards from, you can buy from ourselves. In the shop Smith's. or whatever, right? And this is just generally what you buy. And the easiest way to tell if a card is fake right. is just, if you think you have a fake card, what I'll do is I'll shuffle these up. Uh, and what you'll see oh, on, love this. on the pack here, hopefully. Oh, I can tell easy. Yeah. Ah, that's that obvious. One. Look at the difference Tommy in those Bo, two. Tommy Bo, professional. Uh, yeah, look at no, but it's the print. Yeah. yeah. The print so, like, yeah, yeah. The, the, the front of the cards are easy. It's easy to fool anyone who doesn't know Pokemon. But you but know what? It's just when you were comparing it there, but I suppose you can be fooled because it sort of looks so like exactly, it. Exactly, yeah. And um, Now, like, the market is huge. Mm -hmm. And do you sell mainly online? We, um, the biggest one for us is really just going to, to Mark, as I said, Wickham Way, Marina Market, okay. Cork and, and Dublin Comic Con, where we just get to meet people. Okay. And, and is it just, sorry, is it just Ireland? Like, would you just, or will you go abroad to bigger ones? Is there much bigger ones abroad? There's, there's huge ones. I mean, Ireland is just a small subset of a very, uh, so many popular um, po Pokemon people in so many parts of the world that they, they just come to Ireland to because see cards. This started in 1996 mm -hmm. with just a game on yeah. the Game Boy. Then, yeah. of course, we had that one where everyone was going around with their phones and they're trying to That's, search yeah, for Pokemons. Yeah. You would see all over the television. Uh, uh, Pikachu, is, he's the number one, isn't he? He is. He's right over there beside Vaporeon. Okay. Um, yeah. He is one of the big ones, yeah. So you have got, now you've got something special for us here. I do, yeah. This has been sitting around for quite some time. Uh, it's actually a base set pack from 1999. So this has not been opened. So now, three years after Pokemon even started, this is, Japan. we're going, so wow. This is the first release of cards in, uh, in Ireland. So and this how much been, is that worth? Unopened, about 250 to 300 euro. Opened, it can range from anything from maybe 10 or 15 euro to 
Oh, then palaces. don't open it. We were going to ask you to I open it. I am 100% opening this. Are you? 100%. Why? We're going to do it because it's going to be cool to see on air. Ooh. Okay. So, <laughs> and I haven't opened I haven't opened one of these in probably 20 years, but we are going no to do way. this. We are going to do this today on Where did on you air. get this first of all? Uh, I got it from a, a private collector. We just bought it there about, I think, about a month ago. Um, Right, so there so, could be a good card in there this. Could be, maybe oh, not. So does this mean there could be something in that that'd be worth a lot more than that? There could be, maybe there's not. But even if it's some of the common cards like Pikachu or Charmander, because they're perfect in the pack, you can go and get them graded like the card here. Okay, um, and get them in the little things. Yeah, exactly. Okay, come on, let's open it up, right. Tony. Let's have a look. The nerves here now. I'm equal He's excitement. I've been so nervous about this all morning. So oh you're, my God. Right, you're going okay. to see if there's a card yeah. that. Okay. So what we're going to do is you have to put the first three cards, and that what that does is it puts them in order. So if there's a very good card in it, it's going to be now at the back, hopefully. So what we'll do is we're going to start opening that. Right. So that's a Dratini. Right. Okay. Come on, keep going. A Kakuna. Again, these have not I mean, seen the light of day. These mean nothing to me now. I know. Honestly, but... <laughs> that's perfect. Just tell us if you've hit the goal. Uh, well, yeah, the it'll jackpot. be the end one. It'll, It'll be, be the end, end one. Yeah, yeah, right. fingers crossed. Okay. Oh, it's, it's shaking. I'm shaking because you just don't know. Uh, oh, that's a good one. one. Yeah, and that is actually, that's a... A Weedle. A Weedle. Wow. So it's hard to see. So we've got one energy, we've got a second energy, and if this is big, Come I on. might actually faint. Oh, it's a... It's not so great. It's oh, a no! <laughs> oh, it's a trainer. A trainer kind a of trainer. Believe like, it. Yeah, but still, like that was just amazing just to open that up. So um yeah. Well, thank you very much for doing it. that thank with so us much. live yeah, on no, air. No, no, My no goodness. Did you feel the nerves on that? <laughs> yeah, like yeah. it's actually it's amazing the yeah, whole jeopardy. Yeah. Is there something it good is, or something yeah, not in that, it? That was great fun. You can see why kids get so into this too. Yeah, and I think one of the best things about our company is that we get to meet the next generation of Pokemon fan. So like they come to us, they get some free cards, they go back with a smile on their face and that's what's the And people can for. find out more about you is on pokebundles.ie, but you are of course going to be at Comic-Con. We are. You're going to be there with, yes. because look at these, like there's hundreds of them here. You have actually hundreds. And the Comic-Con is on from the 9th, the 9th and 10th of March. It looks w amazing. What does a trader, uh, trader, trainer card mean? Uh, it's when you're playing the game, it allows you to do certain things with other cards. Okay. So it's not okay. the most exciting card we could have pulled today. Oh. <laughs> we were hoping. Next time. I know. We were hoping. Uh, listen, uh, Tony Gamble, thank you so much. Appreciate the best of luck to you and your wife thank as you. well. Yes, pokebundles.ie if people thank want you. to find Thanks out so more. Much. Oh, Tommy, I know, we're devastated. I'm devastated. <laughs> uh, next, uh, coming up next, Derek has made some furry friends at the Seal Rescue Ireland. Yeah, do stay with us, it's lovely. We'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you. Now, thanks for staying with us. Derek has been catching up with a very important Irish charity this morning. Uh, yes, he's been getting the seal of approval down in Wexford. Derek, how are you getting on? <laughs> the seal of approval is right, guys. Welcome down here to the sunny South East Court Town in County Wexford is where we're at this morning. Girls, did he had any snow the, the other day? No, no, we luckily managed to avoid it here now. It's Costa del Court Town. Co Costa del Court Town is right. Anyway, Natalie and Lauren are with us here this morning. First up, Natalie, uh, tell us about Seal Rescue Ireland. When did you set up? So we first started, it was founded in 2010 and we were actually based down in Dingle in Kerry. Um, by 2014, though, there was a big storm actually just destroyed most of the centre so there was an opportunity then to move to this site that was already built so we've moved up there and we've been here then ever since since 2014. How many seals have we got here in the sanctuary? So at the moment we've got 17 seals here in the centre uh, but we can have as many as 50 55 seals um, and this year in 2023 we took in 172 which is a bit of a record breaking year for us this year. You were telling me earlier on obviously the weather and storms plays a big part uh, with obviously uh, seals getting washed up and getting in Injured, right? Yeah, quite often we get a lot of injuries after stormy weather as well as orphaning and unfortunately we had a few big storms this year in September which kind of coincided right in the middle of popping season for the grey seal so we had a lot of orphans coming in at the end of September due to that stormy weather unfortunately. When we're talking about injuries, what injuries do the seals get when they come in? So it depends, we get a lot of kind of broken digits, a lot of eye injuries we see a lot of, kind of normally they get pushed up against kind of rocky outcrops so they'll end up with big kind of gashes on their heads, on their eyes, so yeah you get a whole range of injuries here, yeah. 
Lauren, you have a very close relationship with the local vets here, uh, just uh, just by Gory as well, yeah? Yes, yeah, it is. Um, and they're able to come in uh, quite often, about every week, really, um, to take a look at our seals, see if their treatment plans need adjusting at all, adding any more meds uh, at all, or things into their wound care. So, yeah, we, we're really close with them. Uh, in terms of um, plastic pollution, ingestion and entanglement, yeah. a massive problem, right? Yes, yeah, it is. So we can have uh, quite a few of the seals that come in here um, uh, coming in because of plastic pollution. And we have our education board here, um, which just has some of the main reasons as to why they come into our care. And yeah, with plastic, um, sometimes they're, they're opportunistic feeders. So sometimes if they see a crisp packet like this that looks super shiny um, in the ocean, they're gonna mistake that for a fish. And um, once that's in their system, any other nutrients that we're then giving them, uh, they're not able to absorb or, in, or digest any of that. So it can be really harmful. And the same with plastic entanglement. So that's largely due to um, discarded fishing nets and fishing gear. Um, and if it's caught around a pup, they grow and put on weight really quickly um, and that net isn't growing with them. So it's getting tighter and tighter and can cause some really nasty injuries. But luckily we can get them into us. We can cut that um, rope off of them and seals heal really, really quickly. So once we've given them uh, the meds that they need, they should be OK to go through our rehab process and then hopefully get released. Uh, Natalie, we were talking about the pups there. and uh, You get a lot of orphans in here, right? We do, unfortunately, yeah, especially around their pupping time. So with the common seals, it's kind of in the summer months, July, end of June, July. And with the grey seals, kind of generally September, October is their main pupping time. So uh, f uh, we do get a lot, <clears throat> because of storms, we might get a lot of orphaning because, yeah, stormy weather can kind of separate the mums and the pups. But it is a big problem as well because of human disturbance. We get a lot of orphans. So a lot of people will see the pups on the beach and usually have good intentions and in trying to help them. We kind of approach to um, closely we'll touch the pups and mum unfortunately if she sees that as a threat she's more likely to save herself so she can have a pup next year so quite often they'll leave the pups as well if they feel like they've been interfered with well, so the message really is I suppose to stay away uh, you've a massive day today tell us what's happening so yeah a bit later on hopefully if the weather holds out we're hoping to release two of them they're going back up to Carlingford um, for yeah, the release day so we'll have get them into the cages, into the van and a long journey up and then back out to the sea. And they're quite social animals, right Lauren? Yeah, they are quite social. So you might see um, sort of large colonies together and generally that is safety in numbers. So although you'll find quite a lot together, they actually don't form any bonds with each other. It's just that crucial moment with their mum at the beginning. Um, so they don't form bonds. They're not super friendly with one another. That's why you might hear they're very noisy sometimes. <laughs> yeah, but you keep the human interaction. You were telling me here to a minimum you've lots of school tours as well lots of educational trips yeah so we're kind of trying to obviously like fix like rescuing the seals is kind of a symptom of a larger problem so we try and focus on the actual problem which is ocean conservation and environmental conservation so we think the best way to approach that is with education so that's why we do a lot of educational programs and yeah we love having the school groups in because kids are really they absorb everything they're little sponges and like they'll take that message home with them so like they're kind of the main audience that we want to target and getting that message out there about protecting our environment and the seals. Lauren, you're always looking for donations, right, and help from volunteers. Yes, yeah, we are. Our volunteers are amazing. So we have full-time volunteers um, here on site and they are the backbone to the place. Um, and we also have our amazing rescue volunteer network of about 800 people around Ireland um, that help to rescue the seals and bring them down to us. So our volunteers are really important. And yes, donations are amazing. We get uh, about 5% uh, of our funds are through government grants and the rest is through donations. All right, where can we find out more online? So go to searescueireland.org and you get all the information on our website. And here, massive on TikTok as well. We've got this little fella here, all made from recycled plastic as well. Check them out online. Absolutely love it for me and all the team here. Court County County Wexford. He's very furry, he's very cuddly, isn't he? Back to the studio. Oh, he's gorgeous. Meet him all good, Derek. You, Derek. Lovely. Lovely Thank down you there this very morning. much for that. Now, before we go this morning, we have to just mention the amount of messages we had. We spoke about over two, 3,000 messages for Joe Shannon uh, on social media yesterday, but our phone lines have been just yeah. jammed all morning. And, and the same thing, everyone just saying the same thing. Joe has been a chef on the show for over 18 years, and we just want to send commiserations, of course, to his family, but also to his, his buddy, Georgie Gorman, who did so much on their radio show and raised so much about cancer awareness and care over the last number of months when Joe got his diagnosis. Both of them They're went brilliant. out 
and did sort of road shows and different things like so that. Inspiring. So inspiring. Yeah. Uh, the Irish Cancer Society support line want viewers to know that they are available if you are needed. Uh, 9 to 5, free phone 1800 200 700 or at irishcancer.ie. And our condolences to Joe Shannon's family. We'll be back with you tomorrow morning from 7am. Have a lovely Great day. day. Bye.